and ramen. Who's hungry? Eat your lucky balls! Welcome to Fan Ramen. The official podcast of Black Ramen. We're a band who writes epic music for films and video games. And we're here to read your fan fiction. I'm Lindy. Konnichiwa. I'm Ralph. Wasabi. Behind the board is our awesome sound guy. And genius beyond compare, the, the alpha, alpha dog, dog Kevin. Kevin. Damn it. Ooh, um, Shinjima. okay, I don't think I'm going to go into the kitchen today. Um, he's got knives. Ralph! What? We're on Spotify now. Oh. That makes us live on five platforms. Sweet. Our power is growing. We are on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, oh. Spotify, wow. Stitcher, Holy. and YouTube. Sweet. You know, we should make this a video podcast one day. Well, what do the kids call it? A, a vodcast, a yeah? A vodcast. We will. We will. We just launched our Patreon this month. So when we get enough funding for a video camera, we can make that happen. Ooh, I better get much better with my makeup then. Our first story is an X-Men fic from P.D. Hudson called Class of 64. P.D. Hudson is on archiveofourown.org, and as always, you can find a link to this story in the show notes, or check out our featured fic page on the website. If you enjoy this story, make sure to give this author some kudos. It's September 1963, and the world's first school for mutants, the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, has just opened its doors. By the end of the school year, the Mutant Registration Act will be law. Half of the faculty and students will be gone, and everyone will have to choose between their ideals and the practical demands of a world spinning out of control. Welcome to the Class of 64. Hope you survive the experience. I hear what people say, and I hear what people think. And in my experience, the two are rarely the same thing. Take my parents. My father, the professor, is holding forth on natural history, one hand on the wheel, the other gesturing towards the exposed rock lining on the Taconic State Parkway. He is saying, Look, Jeannie, you see how all those different colors of rock are all slanted? That's angular unconformity. But, but look at the tops of those hills. The angles are cut off, like smoothed down. And that's because this entire area was buried under a mile-high glacier. The mountains were much higher, much sharper back then. But as the glacier receded, all the ice and gravel scraped the tops of the hills. He is thinking. <sighs> it's all my fault. She was in the womb when I was on that project. I must have exposed her to radiation. I'm the reason she's like this. Why did I take that job? There must have been thousands of physicists that would have given their right arm for the opportunity. The radio says... Involuntary manslaughter for the deaths of six children at St. James Orphanage in Omaha. My mother is on her fourth cigarette since we left Annadale on Hudson. She has asked me if I remember to pack my toothbrush, my curlers, my librium. She is saying... Remember, honey, we're just an hour away. If there's anything you need or you just feel homesick, you can you can always call a cab and come home. We'll pay for it. She is thinking. I'll miss her, but it'll be a relief to have her gone. No, that's not fair. It's not her fault. I'm a terrible mother. No, no, I'm not. All mothers think bad things about their children sometimes. It's just that, that most daughters can't read minds. It's understandable, isn't it? I'm not wanting to watch my own thoughts. Can she hear me now? Is she listening? Our eyes meet in the rearview mirror. Oh, Lord, she is. I'm so sorry, Jean. Oh, I'm a terrible mother. I'm a terrible mother. I'm a terrible... She puts her fourth cigarette out in the ashtray and snatches a fifth, her lighter quivering in her hand. She has to flick the wheel almost ten times before it finally makes a spark. The radio says... Released from the boys' training school, Kearney and delivered into the custody of Dr. Charles Xavier, whose new boarding school is the first ever founded specifically to educate mutants. I slide back in my seat, leaning my aching head against the window and watch the rolling hills fly by. My parents aren't trying to hurt me. Few people are really trying to hurt anyone, but we hurt each other all the time. Luckily for me, 
My parents' thoughts are the only ones I've got to block. Salem Center is in the middle of nowhere. All orchards and horses, farmhouses, and rich people's country estates. Blessed silence. The radio says... Protests from residents of Westchester County who aren't comfortable with such a concentration of mutants in their community. We pass a cow pasture. On the fence, a hand-painted sign reads, Remember the St. James Six. Glacial ice and gravel scrape my stomach. My head pounds. I grab the bottle of aspirin from my purse and swallow two pills. I don't even need water anymore. I try to remember what Professor Xavier told me when he appeared in my room at Payne Whitney Westchester all those years ago. I was curled up in a fetal position, my sheets twisted around me, my hands uselessly clasped over my ears. My bed and its coverings were the only things in the room, and any possessions tended to rise into the air and whip around the room as soon as I got upset or had a nightmare. And even the bed was chained to the floor, because otherwise I had the habit of making it float. The Thorazine did nothing to stop the voices. All it did was help my migraines a little, and drain me of any energy or motivation. Nothing helped, until Professor Xavier wheeled himself into my room. One minute I was bombarded by all the stray thoughts and feelings of everyone within a two-mile radius, and the next minute I wasn't. I pried open my bloodshot eyes and lifted my head from the pillows. I hadn't slept in so long that at first I thought I was hallucinating the bald man in the wheelchair at my bedside. Hello, Jean. My name is Charles Xavier. You... you made the voices stop. Yes. How? Well, I'm a mutant. A telepath like you. And I will tell you exactly how I did it. He told me to picture my mind as a hallway filled with doors. The doors all led to other people's minds. All I had to do was picture the hallway in my mind, focus very intently on that image, then picture myself walking down the hallway and closing the doors one by one. That was the first of the little tricks he taught me. He was a professor of psychology at Columbia University and had read about me in a case file. That got him into Payne Whitney to see me. His story was that he wanted to use experimental new techniques to treat my schizophrenia. He didn't tell anybody that I didn't have schizophrenia. He was actually teaching me to control my telepathy. It took many visits from him, but eventually I got to the point where I could go outside and be in crowds of people without breaking down and even go back to regular school. And now here I am, all functional and nicely dressed and speaking in clear sentences and everything, and all because of closing doors. So I close my eyes to rural New York, and I close the doors in my mind. I close the door to my mother. I close the door to my father. Blessed silence, except for the radio. Rehabilitated. The word means nothing when talking about someone who can kill people by accident. Regardless of good intentions, he will always be a threat to everyone around him. M maybe this wasn't such a good idea, my mother murmurs. What wasn't a good idea? My father asks. Sending Jeannie to the school with all those dangerous mutants. Mother, I'm one of those dangerous mutants, I say. She spins around in her seat, pointing at me with two gloved fingers and one half-ashed cigarette. No, you mustn't say that. You are not like those other mutants. You are not like that boy who killed those children. All you do is hear people's thoughts and move objects with my mind. You couldn't really hurt anyone. Heavy objects, sharp objects. You wouldn't hurt anyone. You're a good girl. The thought would never even occur to you. He didn't do it on purpose. We really ought to keep the conversation civil. My father says quietly. Right before we say goodbye. My mother turns back around in her seat, eyes wet. No, you're right. Might be kinder in the long run just to put a bullet between those eyes of his. With a violent lunge, my mother grabs the radio knobs and changes the station. Soon, the only sound in the car is the Ronettes begging someone to be their baby. We drive in silence. 
I notice the sign for Grey Malkin Lane as my father turns onto it, and then onto a long, winding driveway. The house is masked from the road by a small wood, but once we've passed through that, the land opens up into rolling fields, and the road straightens out into a wide avenue. On either side, rows of beech trees frame the red brick mansion like curtains. A sign out front reads, Xavier, School for Gifted Youngsters. The kind of sign that's brand new, but it's made to look old. Teenagers and their parents pass in and out of the front doors, carrying suitcases and desk lamps and boxes of books. It suddenly occurs to me that I've never met another mutant, except for Professor Xavier. Who are these other mutant kids, anyway? What can they do? Have any of them been in a mental institution? I feel certain somehow that they've all dealt with their gifts better than I have. That even here, I'll be the crazy girl that everybody either makes fun of or <sighs> feels sorry for. My father pulls up and parks on the edge of the house's circular driveway. I take a deep breath and step out of the car, smoothing the folds of my skirt. I don't know if it's my nervousness or everybody else's, but instantly I crash into a wall of thoughts and crumple to the ground. There are too many doors here, and all of them are hanging wide open. Hey, the red hand just collapsed. Close the doors, close the doors. What's wrong? What's wrong? Nobody's going to want to be my friend. Hey, are you all right? When I open my eyes, for a second everything is still black, but, but then my vision slowly returns. I see white gloves on a blue skirt on gray cobblestone, and I, I see my parents hovering around me, their terror emanating from them in waves. And there's a boy kneeling beside me, tall and slender, in a green sweater and a bow tie, with neatly parted brown hair and concerned eyebrows. He's so unassuming, it takes me a moment to realize who I'm looking at. But it's impossible not to notice the eerie glow behind his red-tinted sunglasses. Scott Summers, the St. James Killer. Know what's really cool? Refrigerators? <laughs> I grew up near Westchester. I actually learned how to drive on the Taconic Parkway. Hmm. I bet P.D. Hudson lived in the area, too. He nailed the landscape. I grew up in L.A. I crash everything. <laughs> okay there, Tagger. The next fic is hosted on Archive of Our Own from an author called Skipper14. Those are Roman numerals, so you actually spell this username S-K-I-P-P-E-R-X-I-V. Check out the fic called The Cold Midori Crisis, and be sure to give the story some kudos. The year is 2417, and the delicate piece of the galaxy is on the verge of collapse. For months now, mysterious entities have been appearing at random throughout the galaxy. None of these visitors seem to know where they are or how they got there, and they all claim to hail from planets and cities that do not exist. Ruby Rose finds herself among the ranks of these visitors. After falling through a wormhole into unfamiliar territory, she joins forces with Artemis Fowl, a fellow visitor. Together, they embark on a quest to find their way back home. With every nation in the galaxy casting blame, time is of the essence. Can Ruby and Artemis discover the cause of all this? Or are they both in far over their heads? The galaxy is ancient and full of horrors after all. Ruby Rose trudged through the forest outside her home on Patch. She was looking for something, and she was starting to get discouraged. Her older sister, Yang Chao Long, had told her an incredible story about an ancient temple lost to time somewhere in the woods. She told the tale of a priestess and her followers who tried to wage war against the moon, which was why the moon was broken. The cultist temple was supposedly still out there, and some of its inhabitants were said to continue to wander its corridors, awaiting their leader's return. 
Ruby had been searching the woods for almost three hours now and hadn't seen so much as a large rock. She was starting to think that perhaps Yang had just been messing with her. It certainly wouldn't be the first time. Yang had a penchant for this sort of thing. Yang, you jerk. If you trick me again, you are so dead. Ruby mumbled to herself, ducking under a low-hanging tree branch. Ruby was standing at the top of a steep hill, looking down over the landscape, still trying, in vain, to catch a glimpse of this elusive wonder. She decided it would probably be prudent to head back home. It was starting to get late, and she was pretty sure she heard Yang's voice calling her back to the house. Ruby turned around to go back where she'd come from. That was when it happened. The patch of dirt she'd been standing on was soft and unstable, and her shifting weight proved to be too much. The ground beneath her gave way, and she tumbled backwards down the hill. She saw flashes of light and dark as she rolled down the hill, kicking up leaves and twigs in her wake. She screwed her eyes shut against the pain and disorientation, grunting with every impact she made against the forest floor. Just as suddenly as her tumble started, Ruby was met with a blinding flash of light, and she came to a stop. Ruby suddenly felt very, very cold. She opened her eyes and saw a gray sky totally devoid of trees. She sat up and saw she had somehow landed in an enormous field of snow? It was summer. Why was there snow everywhere? For that matter, where were all the trees? The only thing visible aside from the snow were enormous glaciers towering above the horizon. She pulled out her scroll, which she had mercifully managed to avoid crushing in her fall down the hill, and opened the GPS app. No signal. Cannot reach communications relay. Retrying in 15 seconds. Was she an atlas? It was the only place she could think that would be snowy this time of year, and also didn't have trees. If she was, though, why couldn't her scroll connect? There were chrome towers all over Atlas. Surely there weren't any dead zones. Searching. 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 No signal. Cannot reach communications relay. Retrying in 30 seconds. Ruby stood up and looked around again. She was still met with nothing but snow. No trees, no rocks, no buildings, nothing. Nothing except distant glaciers. She could feel panic starting to set in. What had happened? Had she hit her head and was she just dreaming? Surely not, given how cold she was. Was she dying? Was this what people saw when they died? An endless snowy void? No signal. Cannot reach communications relay. Retrying in 30 seconds. Oh, gods, she was dead. She'd hit her head hard on a big rock or something and somehow died. That was the only explanation. Was it? Oh, by now, Ruby's mind was abuzz with questions and no answers. She'd spun around again and again, hoping to catch some tiny detail she'd missed before. That was hard, given all the thoughts swarming around her mind like a hive of angry bees. Where was she? How had she gotten here? What would Dad and Yang say? Would she ever see them again? Wait, what was that? Something caught Ruby's eye during her wild scan of the horizon. Something dark and far away, right on the horizon. It seemed to move down, then disappeared. She blinked and stared. Had she imagined it? Was this panic driving her crazy? No, no, there it was again, much larger this time. She was able to see it a bit clearer now and realized it was a snowmobile. There was someone piloting it, obviously, but it was hard to tell who. The driver was wearing a big, dark winter suit and a helmet. It disappeared behind another hill. Ruby hoped this person was friendly. She didn't need a fight on top of being lost. Soon, the snowmobile was mere feet away and Ruby could see the person astride it was hardly taller than she was. The vehicle stopped right in front of her, and the pilot dismounted. He took off his helmet to reveal he, indeed it was a he. He had jet black hair, pale skin, and striking blue eyes. Before Ruby could ask for his help, he spoke first. Hello, can you understand me? He asked. His voice had a strange accent to it that Ruby couldn't place. 
Um, yeah, I can understand you, Ruby replied. Very good. May I ask your name? The boy asked. Um, it's Ruby Rose. The boy turned towards his snowmobile and opened a box attached to the side. He pulled out another winter suit, much like his own, as well as a helmet. He gestured for her to walk over to him, and Ruby obliged. The snow was thick, and it took a great effort to trudge through, but the distance was short. The boy handed the clothes to her, and she gratefully donned them. No, doubtless you have questions about your situation, Miss Rose. The boy said, while Ruby slipped on the jacket and pants. I have questions for you as well, but this is neither the time nor the place. Such discussions would be better suited to a more hospitable environment. The boy handed her the helmet, and he was about to put his own back on when Ruby interrupted him. Wait, can you at least tell me where I am? She asked. He sighed in frustration and paused, clearly considering this. <sighs> Very well. You are on a planet called Last de Garvin Shelter, in a universe completely different from your own. Before Ruby could interject again, he held up his hand. As I said earlier, Miss Rose, this is neither the time nor the place for further questions. We should make our way to the settlement as soon as we can. Once we have returned and set your affairs in order, then I will explain as much as I know. With that, the boy replaced his helmet and mounted the vehicle. He gestured for her to join, which she did with some difficulty. It was clearly not designed for two passengers, so Ruby had to crowd herself uncomfortably close to him and hold on tight to him so she didn't fall off. It reminded her of riding on Yang's motorcycle. Thus, the snowmobile turned around and headed back the way it came. Ruby's mind was still swarming with questions. Just who was this boy? Where was he taking her? Did he really say another universe? How was that possible? Was that even possible? Once the two crested a particularly large hill, Ruby saw the answer to her second question. What looked like a town situated at the base of a huge glacier, consisting of many small, shiny metal buildings. Warm light poured out of every window, and Ruby felt a little better, at least. There were people milling around the town, except those weren't people. They didn't look human, and they didn't look like Faunus, either. In fact, they looked like giant penguins. As the snowmobile pulled into the town alongside one of the buildings, Ruby realized one thing was for certain. This wasn't Atlas. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what we do, check out our Patreon. We have outtakes, extras, and bloopers. I never make mistakes. <sighs> but you crash cars. But I'm really good at it. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is Lindy. This is Ralph. And, and we'll, we'll see you the next, next time you're hungry. This podcast produced by Lindy Day and Ralph Avalon. Sound design and engineering by Kevin Villagestone. Music by Black Ramen. Recorded and mixed in the Black Ramen Studios.